Chapter 11 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Fraser. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hunnaker. Chapter 11 Classical Currents. Guy de Maupassant put before us a widely diverse number of novels in a famous essay attached to the definitive edition of his masterpiece, Pierre et Jean, and puzzlingly demanded the real form of the novel. If Don Quixote is one, how can Madame Bovary be another? If Les Miserables is included in the list, what are we to say to Huisman's Le Bas? Just such a question I should like to propound substituting sonata for novel. If Scarlatti wrote sonatas, what is the appassionata? If the A-flat Weber is one, can the F minor Brahms be called a sonata? Is the Haydn form orthodox and the Schumann heterodox? These be enigmas to make worthy the formalists. Come, let us confess, and in the open air, there is a great amount of hypocrisy and cant in this matter. We can, as can any conservatory student, give the recipe for turning out a smug specimen of the form. But when we study the great examples, it is just the subtle eluding of hard and fast rules that distinguishes the efforts of the masters from the machine work of apprentices and academic monsters. Because it is no servile copy of the Mozart sonata, the F-sharp minor of Brahms is a piece of original art. Beethoven, at first, trod in the well-blazed path of Haydn, but study his second period, and it sounds the big Beethoven note. There is no final court of appeal in the matter of musical form, and there is none in the matter of literary style. The history of the sonata is the history of musical evolution. Every great composer, Schubert included, added to the form, filed here, chipped away there, introduced lawlessness where reigned prim order, witness the Schumann F-sharp minor sonata, and then came Chopin. The Chopin sonata has caused almost as much warfare as the Wagner music drama. It is all the more ludicrous, for Chopin never wrote but one piano sonata that has a classical complexion, in C minor, opus 4, and it was composed as early as 1828. Not published until July 1851, it demonstrates without a possibility of doubt that the composer had no sympathy with the form. He tried so hard and failed so dismally that it is a relief when the second and third sonatas are reached, for in them there are only traces of formal beauty and organic unity. But then there is much Chopin, while little of his precious essence is to be tasted in the first sonata. Chopin wrote of the C minor sonata, As a pupil, I dedicated it to Elsner, and, oh, the irony of criticism, it was praised by the critics because it was not so revolutionary as the variations Opus 2. This, too, despite the larghetto in 5-4 time. The first movement is wheezing and all but lifeless. One asks in astonishment what Chopin is doing in this gallery. And it is technically difficult. The menuetto is excellent, its trio being a faint approach to Beethoven in colour. The unaccustomed rhythm of the slow movement is irritating. Our young Chopin does not move about as freely as Benjamin Goddard in the scherzo of his violin and piano sonata in the same bizarre rhythm. Niecks sees naught but barren waste in the finale. I disagree with him. There is the breath of a stirring spirit an imitative attempt that is more diverting than the other movements. Above all, there is movement, and the close is vigorous, though banal. The sonata is the dullest music penned by Chopin, but as a whole it hangs together as a sonata better than its two successors. So much for an attempt at strict devotion to scholastic form. From this schoolroom we are transported in Opus 35, to the theatre of larger life and passion. The B-flat minor sonata 
was published May 1840. Two movements are masterpieces. The funeral march that forms the third movement is one of the Pole's most popular compositions, while the finale has no parallel in piano music. Schumann says that Chopin here bound together four of his maddest children, and he is not astray. He thinks the march does not belong to the work. It certainly was written before its companion movements. As much as Hadoff admires the first two movements, he groans at the last pair, though they are admirable when considered separately. These four movements have no common life. Chopin says he intended the strange finale as a gossiping commentary on the march. The left hand, unisono, with the right hand, are gossiping after the march. Perhaps the last two movements do hold together, but what have they in common with the first two? Tonality proves nothing. Notwithstanding the grandeur and beauty of the grave, the power and passion of the scherzo, this sonata in B-flat minor is not more a sonata than it is a sequence of ballades and scherzi. And again we are at the de Maupassant crux. The work never could be spared. It is Chopin mounted for action and in the thick of the fight. The doppio movimento is pulse-stirring, a strong, curt and characteristic theme for treatment. Here is power, and in the expanding prologue flashes more than a hint of the tragic. The D-flat melody is soothing, charged with magnetism, and urged to a splendid fever of climax. The working out section is too short and dissonantal, but there is development, perhaps more technical than logical. I mean by this, more pianistic than intellectually musical. And we mount with the composer until the B-flat version of the second subject is reached, for the first subject, strange to say, does not return. From that on, to the firm chords of the close, there is no misstep, no faltering or obscurity. Noble pages have been read, and the scherzo is approached with eagerness. Again, there is no disappointment. On numerous occasions, I have testified my regard for this movement in warm and uncritical terms. It is simply unapproachable, and has no equal for lucidity, brevity, and polish among the works of Chopin, except the scherzo in C-sharp minor, but there is less irony, more muscularity, and more native sweetness in this E-flat minor scherzo. I like the way Kulak marks the first B-flat octave. It is a pregnant beginning. The second bar I have never heard from any pianist save Rubenstein given with the proper crescendo. No one else seems to get it explosive enough within the walls of one bar. It is a true Rossinian crescendo. And in what a wild country we are landed when the F-sharp minor is crashed out. Stormy chromatic double notes, chords of the sixth, rush on with incredible fury, and the scherzo ends on the very apex of passion. A trio in G-flat is the song of songs, its swaying rhythms and phrase echoings investing a melody at once sensuous and chaste. The second part, and the return to the scherzo, are proofs of the composer's sense of balance and knowledge of the mysteries of anticipation. The closest parallelisms are noticeable, the technique so admirable that the scherzo floats in mid-air, Flaubert's ideal of a miraculous style, and then follows that deadly marche funèbre. Ernest Newman, in his remarkable study of Wagner, speaks of the fundamental difference between the two orders of imagination, as exemplified by Beethoven and Chopin on the one side, Wagner on the other. This, regarding the funeral marches of the three, Newman finds Wagner's the more concrete imagination, the inward picture of Beethoven and Chopin much vaguer and more diffused. Yet Chopin is seldom so realistic. Here are the bell-like bases, the morbid colouring. Schumann found it contained much that is repulsive, and Liszt raves rhapsodically over it. For Karasowski, it was the pain and grief of an entire nation. While Ehlert thinks it owes its renown to the wonderful effect of two triads, which in their combination possess a highly tragical element. The middle movement is not at all characteristic. Why could it not, at least, have worn second mourning? After so much black crepe drapery, 
one should not at least at once display white lingerie. This is cruel. The D-flat trio is a logical relief after the booming and glooming of the opening. That it is a rapturous gaze into the beatific regions of a beyond, as Niex writes, I am not prepared to say. We do know, however, that the march, when isolated, has a much more profound effect than in its normal sequence. The presto is too wonderful for words. Rubenstein, or was it originally Torsig, who named it Night Wind Sweeping Over the Churchyard Graves? Its agitated, whirring, unharmonized triplets are strangely disquieting, and can never be mistaken for mere etude passage work. The movement is too somber, its curves too full of half-suppressed meanings, its rush and subhuman growling too expressive of something that defies definition. Schumann compares it to a sphinx with a mocking smile. To Henri Babadette, c'est l'azar gratin des saisons la pierre de son tombeau. Or, like Mendelssohn, one may abhor it, yet it cannot be ignored. It has Asiatic colouring, and to me seems like the wavering outlines of light-tipped hills seen sharply in silhouette, behind which rises and falls a faint infernal glow. This art paints as many differing pictures as there are imaginations for its sonorous background. Not alone the universal solvent, as Henry James thinks, it bridges the vast silent gulfs between human souls with its humming eloquence. This sonata is not dedicated. The third sonata in B minor, opus 58, has more of that undefinable organic unity. Yet, withal, it is not so powerful, so pathos-breeding, or so compact of thematic interest as its forerunner. The first page to the chromatic chords of the sixth promises much. There is a clear statement, a sound theme for developing purposes, the crisp march of chord progressions, and then the edifice goes up in smoke. After wreathings and curlings of passage work, and on the rim of despair, we witness the exquisite budding of the melody in D. It is an orbard, a nocturne of the morn, if the contradictory phrase be allowed. There is morning freshness in its hue and scent, and when it bursts, a parterre of roses. The close of the section is inimitable. All the more sorrow at what follows, wild disorder and the luxuriance called tropical. When B major is compassed, we sigh, for it augurs us a return of delight. The ending is not that of a sonata, but a love lyric. For Chopin is not the cool breadth and marmorial majesty of blank verse. He sonnets to perfection, but the epical air does not fill his nostrils. Vivacious, charming, light as a harebell in the soft breeze, is the scherzo in E-flat. It has a clear ring of the scherzo, and harks back to Weber in its impersonal, amiable hurry. The Largo is tranquilly beautiful, rich in its reverie, lovely in its tune. The trio is reserved and hypnotic. The last movement, with its brilliancy and force, is a favourite, but it lacks weight, and the entire sonata is, as Nyex writes, affiliated but not cognate. It was published in June 1845 and is dedicated to Comtesse I de Pethuy. So these sonatas of Chopin are not sonatas at all, but, throwing titles to the dogs, would we forego the sensations that two of them evoke? There is still another, the Sonata in G minor, opus 65, for piano and cello. It is dedicated to Chopin's friend, Auguste Francom, the violoncellist. Now, while I by no means share Finks's exalted impression of this work, yet I fancy the critics have dealt too harshly with it. Robbed of its title of Sonata, though sedulously aping this form, it contains much pretty music and it is grateful for the cello. There is not an abundant literature for this kingly instrument, in conjunction with the piano, so why flaunt Chopin's contribution? I will admit that he walks stiffly, encased in his borrowed garb, but there is the andante, short as it is, an effective scherzo, and the carefully made allegro and finale. 
tonal monotony is the worst charge to be brought against this work. The trio, also in G minor, Opus 8, is more alluring. It was published March 1833 and dedicated to Prince Anton Radzivill. Chopin, later, in speaking of it to a pupil, admitted that he saw things he would like to change. He regretted not making it for viola instead of violin, cello and piano. It was worked over a long time, the first movement being ready in 1833. When it appeared, it won Philistine praise, for its form more nearly approximates the sonata than any of his efforts in the cyclical order, excepting Opus 4. In it, the piano receives better treatment than the other instruments. There are many virtuoso passages, but again key changes are not frequent or disparate enough to avoid a monotone. Chopin's imagination refuses to become excited when working in the open spaces of the sonata form. Like creatures that remain drab of hue in unsympathetic or dangerous environment, his music is transformed to a bewildering bouquet of colour when he breathes native air. Compare the wildly modulating Chopin of the ballades to the tame pacing Chopin of the sonatas, trio and concertos. The trio opens with fire, the scherzo is fanciful, and the adagio charming, while the finale is cheerful to loveliness. It might figure occasionally on the programmes of our chamber music concerts, despite its youthful puerility. There remain the two concertos, which I do not intend discussing fully. Not Chopin at his very best, the E minor and F minor concertos are frequently heard because of the chances afforded the solo player. I have written elsewhere at length of the Klindworth, Tausig and the Burmeister versions of the two concertos. As time passes, I see no reason for amending my views on this troublous subject. Edgar S. Kelly holds a potent brief for the original orchestration, contending that it suits the character of the piano part. Rosenthal puts the belief into practice by playing the older version of the E minor with the first long tutti curtailed. But he is not consistent, for he uses the torsig octaves at the close of the rondo. While I admire the torsig orchestration, these particular octaves are hideously cacophonic. The original triplet unisons are so much more graceful and musical. The chronology of the concertos has given rise to controversy. The trouble arose from the F minor concerto, it being numbered Opus 21, although composed before the one in E minor. The former was published April 1836, the latter September 1833. The slow movement of the F minor concerto was composed by Chopin during his passion for Constantia Gladowska. She was the ideal he mentions in his letters, the adagio of this concerto. This larghetto in A-flat is a trifle too ornamental for my taste, mellifluous and serene as it is. The recitative is finely outlined. I think I like best the romanza of the E minor concerto. It is less flowery. The C-sharp minor part is imperious in its beauty, while the murmuring mystery of the close mounts to the imagination. The rondo is frolicsome, tricky, genial, and genuine piano music. It is true the first movement is too long, too much in one set of keys, and the working out section too much in the nature of a technical study. The first movement of the F minor far transcends it in breadth, passion, and musical feeling, but it is short and there is no coda. Ricard Burmeister has supplied the latter deficiency in a capitally made cadenza, which Paderewski plays. It is a complete summing up of the movement. The mazurka-like finale is very graceful and full of pure, sweet melody. This concerto is altogether more human than the E minor. Both derive from Hummel and Field. The passage work is superior in design to that of the earlier masters, the general character episodical, but episodes of rare worth and originality. As Ellert says, noblesse oblige, and thus Chopin felt himself compelled to satisfy all demands exacted of a pianist, and wrote the unavoidable piano concerto. 
It was not consistent with his nature to express himself in broad terms. His lungs were too weak for the pace in seven-league boots, so often required in a score. The trio and cello sonata were also tasks for whose accomplishment nature did not design him. He must touch the keys by himself without being called upon to heed the players sitting next him. He is at his best when without formal restraint he can create out of his inmost soul. He must touch the keys by himself. There you have summed up in a phrase the reason Chopin never succeeded in impressing his individuality upon the sonata form and his playing upon the masses. His was the lonely soul. George Sand knew this when she wrote, he made an instrument speak the language of the infinite. Often in ten lines that a child might play, he has introduced poems of unequalled elevation, dramas unrivalled in force and energy. He did not need the great material methods to find expression for his genius. Neither saxophone nor ophicleide was necessary for him to fill the soul with awe. Without church organ or human voice, he inspired faith and enthusiasm. It might be remarked here that Beethoven too aroused a wondering and worshipping world without the aid of saxophone or ophicleide. But it is needless cruelty to pick at Madame Sand's criticisms. She had no technical education, and so little appreciation of Chopin's peculiar genius for the piano that she could write, The day will come when his music will be arranged for orchestra without change of the piano score which is disaster-breeding nonsense. We have sounded Chopin's weakness when writing for any instrument but his own, when writing in any form but his own. The E minor concerto is dedicated to Frederick Kalkbrenner, the F minor to the Comtesse Delphine Pototska. The latter dedication demonstrates that he could forget his only ideal in the presence of the charming Pototska. Ah, these vibratile and versatile poles. Robert Schumann, it is related, shook his head wearily when his early work was mentioned. Dreary stuff, said the composer, whose critical sense did not fail him even in so personal a question. What Chopin thought of his youthful music may be discovered in his scanty correspondence. To suppose that the young Chopin sprang into the arena a fully equipped warrior is one of those nonsensical notions which gains currency among persons unfamiliar with the law of musical evolution. Chopin's musical ancestry is easily traced. As Poe had his holly chivers, Chopin had his field. The germs of his second period are all there. From Opus 1 to Opus 22, virtuosity, for virtuosity's sake, is very evident. Liszt has said that in every young artist there is the virtuoso fever and Chopin, being a pianist, did not escape the fever of the footlights. He was composing, too, at a time when piano music was well-nigh strangled by excess of ornament, when acrobats were kings, when the Bach fugue and Beethoven sonata lurked neglected and dusty in the memories of the few. Little wonder, then, we find this individual youthful Pole, not timidly treading in the path of popular composition, but bravely carrying his banner, spangled, glittering and fanciful, and outstripping at their own game all the virtuosi of Europe. His originality in this bejeweled work caused Hummel to admire and Kalkbrenner to wonder. The supple fingers of the young man from Warsaw made quick work of existing technical difficulties. He needs must invent some of his own, and when Schumann saw the pages of Opus II, he uttered his historical cry. Today, we wonder somewhat at his enthusiasm. It is the old story. A generation seeks to know, a generation comprehends and enjoys, and a generation discards. Opus 1, a rondo in C minor, dedicated to Madame de Linde, saw the light in 1825, but it was preceded by two polonaises, a set of variations, and two mazurkas in G and B flat minor. Schumann declared, that Chopin's first published work was his tenth, and that between Opus 1 and 2 there lay two years and twenty works. Be this as it may, one cannot help liking the C minor rondo. In the A flat section, 
we detect traces of his F minor concerto. There is lightness, joy in creation, which contrast with the heavy, dour quality of the C minor sonata opus 4. Loosely constructed in a formal sense, and too exuberant for his strict confines, this opus 1 is remarkable, much more remarkable than Schumann's Abegg variations. The Rondo à la Mazur in F is a further advance. It is dedicated to Comtesse Mériolet and was published in 1827. Schumann reviewed it in 1836. It is sprightly, Polish in feeling and rhythmic life, and a glance at any of its pages gives us the familiar Chopin impression, florid passage work, chords in extensions, and chromatic progressions. The concert rondo, opus 14 in F, called Krakowiak, is built on a national dance in 2-4 time, which originated in Cracovia. It is, to quote Nayak's, a modified polonaise, danced by the peasants with lusty abandon. Its accentual life is usually manifested on an unaccented part of the bar, especially at the end of a section or phrase. Chopin's very Slavic version is spirited, but the virtuoso predominates. There is lushness in ornamentation, and a bold merry spirit informs every page. The orchestral accompaniment is thin, dedicated to the Princess Tsartoriska, it was published June 1834. The Rondo, Opus 16, with an introduction, is in great favour at the conservatories and is neat rather than poetical, although the introduction has dramatic touches. It is to this brilliant piece, with its Weberish affinities, that Ricard Burmeister has supplied an orchestral accompaniment. The remaining Rondo, posthumously published as Opus 73, and composed in 1828, was originally intended, so Chopin writes in 1828, for one piano. It is full of fire, but the ornamentation runs mad, and no traces of the poetical Chopin are present. He is preoccupied with the brilliant surfaces of the life about him. His youthful expansiveness finds a fair field in these variations, rondos and fantasias. Schumann's enthusiasm over the variations on La Cidadem La Mano, seems to us a little overdone. Chopin had not much gift for variation in the sense that we now understand variation. Beethoven, Schumann and Brahms, one must include Mendelssohn's serious variations, are masters of a form that is by no means structurally simple, or a reversion to mere spielerei, as Fink fancies. Chopin plays with his themes prettily, but it is all surface display, all heat lightning. He never smites, as does Brahms with his Thor hammer, the subject full in the middle, cleaving it to its core. Chopin is slightly effeminate in his variations, and they are true specimens of spielerei. Despite the cleverness of design in the arabesques, their brilliancy and euphony. Opus 2 has its dazzling moments, but its musical worth is inferior. It is written to split the ears of the groundlings, or rather to astonish and confuse them, for the Chopin dynamics in the early music are never very rude. The indisputable superiority to Hertz and the rest of the shallow-pated variationists caused Schumann's passionate admiration. It has, however, given us an interesting page of music criticism. Relstab, grumpy old fellow, was near right when he wrote of these variations that the composer runs down the theme with roulades and throttles and hangs it with chains of shakes. The skip makes its appearance in the fourth variation, and there is no gainsaying the brilliancy and piquant spirit of the Alla Polaccia. Opus 2 is orchestrally accompanied, an accompaniment that may be gladly dispensed with and dedicated by Chopin to the friend of his youth, Titus Wojciechowski. Jevon de Scapulaire is a tune in Harold and Halloway's Ludovic. Chopin varied it in his Opus 12. This rondo in B-flat is the weakest of Chopin's muse. It is Chopin and water, and Gallic au supri at that. The piece is written tastefully, is not difficult, but woefully artificial. Published in 1833, it was dedicated to Miss Emma Horsford. 
in May 1851, appeared the variations in E without an opus number. They are not worth the trouble. Evidently composed before Chopin's Opus 1 and before 1830, they are musically light-wasted, although written by one who already knew the keyboard. The last, a valse, is the brightest of the set. The theme is German. The Fantaisie, Opus 13 in A, on Polish airs, preceded by an introduction in F-sharp minor, is dedicated to the pianist J.P. Pixis. It was published in April 1834. It is Chopin brilliant. Its orchestral background does not count for much, but the energy, the colour, and Polish character of the piece endeared it to the composer. He played it often, and as Klesinski asks, are these brilliant passages, these cascades of pearly notes, these bold leaps, the sadness and the despair of which we hear? Is it not rather youth exuberant with intensity in life? Is it not happiness, gaiety, love for the world and men? The melancholy notes are there to bring out, to enforce the principal ideas. For instance, in the Fantasy Opus 13, the theme of Kropinski moves and saddens us. But the composer does not give time for this impression to become durable. He suspends it by means of a long trill, and then suddenly, by a few chords and with a brilliant prelude, leads us to a popular dance with the peasant couples of Mazovia. Does the finale indicate, by its minor key, the gaiety of a man devoid of hope, as the Germans say? Klesinski then tells us that a Polish proverb, a fig for misery, is the keynote of a nation that dances furiously to music in the minor key. Elevated beauty, not sepulchral gaiety is the character of Polish, of Chopin's music. This is a valuable hint. There are variations in the fantasy which end with a merry and vivacious Kujawiak. The F minor fantasy will be considered later. Neither by its magnificent content, construction, nor opus number, 49, does it fall into this chapter. The Allegro de Concert in A, opus 46, was published in November 1841 and dedicated to Mademoiselle Frédéric Muller, a pupil of Chopin. It has all the characteristics of a concerto and is indeed a truncated one, much more so than Schumann's F minor sonata, called Concert sans orchestre. There are two T in the Chopin work, the solo part not really beginning until the 87th bar, but it must not be supposed that these long introductory passages are ineffective for the player. The Allegro is one of Chopin's most difficult works. It abounds in risky skips, ampuscards of dangerous double notes, and the principal themes are bold and expressive. The colour note is strikingly adapted for public performance, and perhaps Schumann was correct in believing that Chopin had originally sketched this for piano and orchestra. Nyex asks if this is not the fragment of a concerto for two pianos which Chopin, in a letter written at Vienna, December the 21st, 1830, said he would play in public with his friend Nideski if he succeeded in writing it to his satisfaction. And is there any significance in the fact that Chopin, when sending this manuscript to Fontana, probably in the summer of 1841, calls it a concerto? While it adds little to Chopin's reputation, it has the potentialities of a powerful and more manly composition than either of the two concertos. Jean-Louis Nicode has given it an orchestral garb, besides arranging it for two pianos. He has added a developing section of 70 bars. This version was first played in New York a decade ago by Marie Geselschap, a Dutch pianist, under the direction of the late Anton Seidel. The original, it must be acknowledged, is preferable. The Bolero, Opus 19, has a polonaise flavour. There is but little Spanish in its ingredients. It is merely a memorandum of Chopin's early essays in dance forms. It was published in 1834, four years before Chopin's visit to Spain. Nyex thinks it an early work. That it can be made effective was proven by Emil Sauer. It is for fleet-fingered pianists, 
and the principal theme has the rhythmical ring of the Polonaise, although the most Iberian in character. It is dedicated to Comtesse E. de Flau. In the key of A minor, its coda ends in A major. Willoughby says it is in C major. The Tarantella is in A-flat and is numbered Opus 43. It was published in 1841 and bears no dedication. Composed at Noant, it is as little Italian as the Bolero is Spanish. Chopin's visit to Italy was of too short a duration to affect him, at least in the style of dance. It is without the necessary Ophidian tang and far inferior to Heller and Liszt's efforts in the constricted form. One finds little of the frenzy ascribed to it by Schumann in his review. It breathes of the north, not the south, and ranks far below the A-flat impromptu in geniality and grace. The C minor funeral march, composed according to Fontana in 1829, sounds like Mendelssohn. The trio has the processional quality of a Parisian funeral cortege. It is modest and in no ways remarkable. The three Ecossaises, published as Opus 73, number 3, are little dances, Scottishes, nothing more. Number 2 in G is highly popular in girls' boarding schools. The Grand Duo Concertant for cello and piano is jointly composed by Chopin and Francom on themes from Robert Le Diable. It begins in E and ends in A major, and is without opus number. Schumann thinks Chopin sketched the whole of it, and that Francom said yes to everything. It is for the Salon of 1833 when it was published. It is empty, tiresome, and only slightly superior to compositions of the same sort by de Berio and Osborne, full of rapid elegances and shallow passage work. This duo is certainly a pièce d'occasion, the occasion probably being the need of ready money. The 17 Polish songs were composed between 1824 and 1844. In the psychology of the laid, Chopin was not happy. Karasowski writes that many of the songs were lost, and some of them are still sung in Poland, their origin being hazy. The 3rd of May is cited as one of these. Chopin had a habit of playing songs for his friends, but neglected putting some of them on paper. The collected songs are under the opus head 74. The words are by his friends, Stephen Witwicki, Adam Mikiewicz, Bogdan Zaleski, and Sigismond Krasinski. The first in the key of A, The Familiar Maiden's Wish, has been brilliantly paraphrased by Liszt. This pretty mazurka is charmingly sung and played by Marcella Sembrick in the singing lesson of the Barber of Seville. There are several mazurkas in the list. Most of these songs are mediocre. Poland's dirge is an exception, and so is Horseman Before the Battle. Was ein junges Madchen liebt has a short introduction in which the reminiscence hunter may find a true bit of Meistersinger colour. Simple in structure and sentiment, the Chopin Leder seem almost rudimentary compared to essays in this form by Schubert, Schumann, Franz, Brahms and Tchaikovsky. A word of recommendation may not be amiss here regarding the technical study of Chopin. Klesinski, in his two books, gives many valuable hints, and Isidore Philipp has published a set of Exercises Quotidiennes made up of specimens in double notes, octaves, and passages taken from the works. Here, skeletonized, are the special technical problems. In these daily studies, and his edition of the Etudes, are numerous examples dealt with practically. For a study of Chopin's ornaments, Mertke has discussed at length the various editorial procedure in the matter of attacking the trill in single and double notes. Also, the easiest method of executing the flying scud and vapours of the fioriture. This may be found in number 179 of the edition Steingraber. Philip's collection is published in Paris by J. Hamel and is prefixed by some interesting remarks of George Matthias. Chopin's portrait in 1833, after Vigneron, 
is included. One composition more is to be considered. In 1837, Chopin contributed the sixth variation of the march from I Puritani. These variations were published under the title Exameron, Morceau de Concert, Grande Variation du Bravoure sur le Marche de Puritan de Bellini, Composés pour le Concert de Madame la Princesse Belgiojoso, au bénéfice de pauvres, par Liszt, Talberg, Pixis, H. R. Cherny et Chopin. Liszt wrote an orchestral accompaniment never published. His pupil, Maurice Rosenthal, is the only modern virtuoso who plays the examiral in his concerts, and play it he does with overwhelming splendour. Chopin's contribution in E major is in his sentimental salon mood. Musically, it is the most impressive of this extraordinary mastodonic survival of the pianistic past. The newly published fugue, or fugato, in A minor, in two voices, is from a manuscript in the possession of Natalie Janotha, who probably got it from the late Princess Zartoriska, a pupil of the composer. The composition is ineffective and in spots ugly, particularly in the stretta, and is no doubt an exercise during the working years with Elsner. The fact that in the coda the very suspicious octave pedal point and trills may be omitted, so the editorial note runs, leads one to suspect that out of a fragment Janotha has evolved, Cuvier-like, an entire composition. Chopin as fugue maker does not appear in a brilliant light. Is the Polish composer to become a musical Hugh Conway? Why all these dischecked a member of a sketchbook? In these youthful works may be found the beginnings of the greater Chopin, but not his vast subjugation of the purely technical to the poetic and spiritual. That came later. To the devout Chopinist, the first compositions are so many proofs of the joyful, victorious spirit of the man whose spleen and pessimism have been wrongly compared to Leopardi's and Baudelaire's. Chopin was gay, fairly healthy, and bubbling over with a pretty malice. His first period shows this. It also shows how thorough and painful the processes by which he evolved his final style. End of chapter 11. Recording by Daniel Fraser. Chapter 12 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Clip. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Huneker. Chapter 12 The Polonaises, Heroic Hymns of Battle. How is one to reconcile the want of manliness, moral and intellectual? which Haddo asserts is the one great limitation of Chopin's province, with the power, splendor, and courage of the Polonaises. Here are the cannon buried in flowers of Robert Schumann. Here overwhelming evidences of versatility, virility, and passion. Chopin blinded his critics and admirers alike. A delicate, puny fellow, he could play the piano on occasion like a devil incarnate. He, too, had his demon, as well as Liszt, and only, as Ellert puts it, theatrical fear of this spirit driving him over the cliffs of reason made him curve its antics. After all the Couleur de Rosé portraits and lollipop miniatures made of him by pensive, poetical persons, it is not possible to conceive Chopin as being irascible and almost brutal. Yet he was at times even this. Beethoven was scarce more vehement and irritable, writes Ellert. And we remember the stories of friends and pupils who have seen this slender, refined Pole wrestling with his wrath as one under the obsession of a fiend. It is no desire to exaggerate this side of his nature that impels this plain writing. Chopin left compositions that bear witness to his masculine side. Diminutive in person, bad temper became him ill. Besides, his whole education and tastes were opposed to scenes of violence. So this energy, spleen, and raging at fortune found escape in some of his music, became psychial in its manifestations. But, you may say, this is feminine hysteria, 
the impotent cries of an unmanly, weak nature. Read the E-flat minor, the C minor, the A major, the F-sharp minor, and the two A-flat major polonaises. Ballads, scherzi, studies, preludes, and the great F minor fantasie are purposely omitted from this awing scheme. Chopin was weak in physique, but he had the soul of a lion. Allied to the most exquisite poetic sensibilities, one is reminded here of Balzac's Ce beau genie est mon un musicien qu'on dîne qui se rend sensible. There was another nature, fiery, implacable. He loved Poland. He hated her oppressors. There is no doubt he idealized his country and her wrongs until the theme grew out of all proportion. Politically, the Poles and Celts rub shoulders. Nix points out that if Chopin was a flattering idealist as a national poet, as a personal poet, he was an uncompromising realist. So in the Polonaises we find two distinct groups. In one, the objective, martial side predominates. In the other is Chopin, the moody, mournful, and morose. But in all, the Polish element pervades. Barring the mazurkas, these dances are the most Polish of his works. Appreciation of Chopin's wide diversity of temperament would have spared the world the false, silly, distorted portraits of him. He had the warrior in him, even if his mailed fist was seldom used. There are moments when he discards the gloves and soft phrases and deals blows that reverberate with formidable clangor. By all means, read Liszt's gorgeous description of the Polonaise. Originating during the last half of the 16th century, it was at first a measured procession of nobles and their womankind to the sound of music. In the court of Henry of Anjou in 1574, after his election to the Polish throne, the Polonaise was born and throve in the hardy warlike atmosphere. It became a dance political and had words set to it. Thus came the Kosciusko, the Oginski, the Moniuszko, the Kurpinski, and a long list written by composers with names ending in Ski. It is really a march, a processional dance, grave, moderate, flowing, and by no means stereotyped. Liszt tells of the capricious life infused into its courtly measures by the Polish aristocracy. It is at once the symbol of war and love, a vivid pageant of martial splendor, a weaving, cadence, voluptuous dance, the pursuit of shy, coquettish women by the fierce warrior. The Polonaise is in 3-4 time, with the accent on the second beat of the bar. In simple binary form, ternary if a trio is added, this dance has feminine endings to all the principal cadences. The rhythmical cast of the bass is seldom changed. Despite its essentially masculine mold, it is given a feminine title. Formerly, it was called Polonaise. Liszt wrote of it. In this form, the noblest traditional feelings of ancient Poland are represented. The Polonaise is the true and purest type of Polish national character, as in the course of centuries it was developed partly through the political position of the kingdom toward east and west, partly through an undefinable, peculiar inborn disposition of the entire race. In the development of the Polonaise, everything cooperated which specifically distinguished the nation from others. In the poles of departed times, manly resolution was united with glowing devotion to the object of their love. Their knightly heroism was sanctioned by high-soaring dignity, and even the laws of gallantry and the national costume exerted an influence over the terms of this dance. The Polonaises are the keystone in the development of this form. They belong to the most beautiful of Chopin inspirations. With their energetic rhythm, they electrify, to the point of excited demonstration, even the sleepiest indifferentism. Chopin was born too late, and left his native hearth too early, to be initiated into the original character of the Polonaise as danced through his own observation, but what others imparted to him in regard to it was supplemented by his fancy and his nationality. Chopin wrote fifteen Polonaises, the authenticity of one in G-flat major being doubted by Nietzsche. This list includes the Polonaise for viola, cello, and piano, opus 3, and the Polonaise opus 22 for piano and orchestra. This latter Polonaise is preceded by an andante spianato in G in 6-8 time and unaccompanied. It is a charming, liquid-toned, nocturne-like composition, Chopin in his most suave, his most placid mood. A barcarol, scarcely a ripple of emotion, disturbs the mirrored calm of this lake. 
After sixteen bars of a crudely harmonized tutti comes the polonaise in the widely remote key of E flat. It is brilliant, every note telling, the figuration rich and novel, the movement spirited and flowing. Perhaps it is too long and lacks relief. The theme on each re-entrance is varied ornamentally. The second theme, in C minor, has a Polish and poetic ring, while the coda is effective. This opus is vivacious, but not characterized by great depth. Crystalline, gracious, and refined, the piece is stamped Paris, the elegant Paris of 1830. Composed in that year and published in July 1836, it is dedicated to the Baron d'Est. Chopin introduced it at the Conservatoire concert for the benefit of Habenick, April 26, 1835. This, according to Niecks, was the only time he played the Polonaise with orchestral accompaniment. It was practically a novelty to New York when Raphael Giuseppe played it here superlatively well in 1879. The orchestral part seems wholly superfluous, for the scoring is not particularly effective, and there is a rumor that Chopin cannot be held responsible for it. Xaver Sharvenka made a new instrumentation that is discreet and extremely well-sounding. With excellent tact, he has managed to add accompaniment to the introduction, giving some thematic work of the slightest texture to the strings, and in the pretty coda to the woodwind. A delicately managed allusion is made by the horns to the second theme of the nocturne in G. There are even five faint taps of the triangle, and the idyllic atmosphere is never disturbed. Sharvenka first played this arrangement at the Sedi Memorial Concert in Chinkering Hall, New York, April 1898, yet I cannot truthfully say the Polonaise sounds so characteristic as when played solo. The C-sharp minor Polonaise, opus 26, has had the misfortune of being sentimentalized to death. What can be more appassionata than the opening with its grand rhythmical swing? It is usually played by timid persons in a sugar-sweet fashion, although FFF stares them in the face. The first three lines are hugely heroic, but the indignation soon melts away, leaving an apathetic humor. After the theme returns and is repeated, we get a genuine love motif tender enough in all faith wherewith to woo a princess. On this, the Polonaise closes, an odd ending for such a fiery opening. In no such mood does number two begin. In E-flat minor, it is variously known as the Siberian, the Revolt Polonaise. It breathes defiance and rancor from the start. What suppressed and threatening rumblings are there? Volcanic mutterings, these. Musical score excerpt. It is a sinister page, and all the more so because of the injunction to open with pianissimo. One wishes that the shrill, high G-flat had been written in full chords as the theme suffers from a want of massiveness. Then follows a subsidiary, but the principal subject returns relentlessly. The episode in B major gives pause for breathing. It has a hint of Meyerbeer. But again, with smothered explosions, the Polonaise proper appears, and all ends in gloom and the impotent clanking of chains. It is an awe-provoking work this terrible Polonaise in E-flat minor, opus 26. It was published July 1836 and is dedicated to M. J. Dessur. Not so the celebrated A major Polonaise, opus 40, Le Militaire. To Rubinstein, this seemed a picture of Poland's greatness, as its companion in C minor is of Poland's downfall. Although Karasowski and Kleczynski give to the A-flat major polonaise the honor of suggesting a well-known story, it is really the A major that provoked it, so the Polish portrait painter Kwiatowski informs Niecks. The story runs that after composing it, Chopin, in the dreary watches of the night, was surprised, terrified is a better word, by the opening of his door and the entrance of a long train of Polish nobles and ladies, richly robed, who moved slowly by him. Troubled by the ghosts of the past he had raised, the composer, hollow-eyed, fled the apartment. All this must have been at Majorca, for Opus 40 was composed and finished there. Ailing, weak, and unhappy as he was, Chopin had grit enough to file and polish this brilliant and striking composition into its present shape. 
It is the best known, and, though the most muscular of his compositions, it is the most played. It is dedicated to J. Fontana, and was published November 1840. This Polonaise has the festive glitter of Weber. The C minor Polonaise of the same set is a noble, troubling composition, large in accents and deeply felt. Can anything be more impressive than this opening? Musical score excerpts. It is indeed Poland's downfall. The trio in A-flat, with its kaleidoscopic modulations, produces an impression of vague unrest and suppressed sorrow. There is a loftiness of spirit and daring in it. What can one say new of the tremendous F-sharp minor polonaise? Willoughby calls it noisy. And Stanislaw Przybyszewski, whom Vance Thompson christened a prestigious noctambulist, has literally stormed over it. It is barbaric. It is perhaps pathologic, and of it Liszt has said the most eloquent things. It is for him a dream poem, the lurid hour that precedes a hurricane, with a convulsive shudder at its close. The opening is very impressive, the nerve pulp being harassed by the gradually swelling prelude. There is defiant power in the first theme, and the constant reference to it betrays the composer's exasperated mental condition. This tendency to return upon himself, a tormenting introspection, certainly signifies a grave state. But consider the musical weight of the work, the recklessly bold outpourings of a mind almost distraught. There is no greater test for the poet-pianist than the F-sharp minor polonaise. It is profoundly ironical. What else means the introduction of that lovely mazurka, a flower between two abysses? This strange dance is ushered in by two of the most enigmatic pages of Chopin. The A major intermezzo, with its booming cannons and reverberating of overtones, is not easily defensible on the score of form, yet it unmistakably fits in the picture. The mazurka is full of interrogation and emotional nuancern. The return of the tempest is not long delayed. It bursts, wanes, and with the coda comes sad yearning. Then the savage drama passes tremblingly into the night after fluid and wavering affirmations, a roar in F-sharp, and finally a silence that marks the cessation of an agitating nightmare. No saber dance this, but a confession from the dark depths of a self-tortured soul. Opus 44 was published November 1841, and is dedicated to Princesse de Beauvau. There are few editorial differences. In the 18th bar from the beginning, Kulak, in the second beat, fills out an octave. Not so in Clindworth, nor in the original. At the 20th bar, Clindworth differs from the original as follows. The Chopin text is the upper one. Musical score excerpts. The A-flat Polonaise, Op. 53, was published December 1843, and is said by Karasowski to have been composed in 1840, after Chopin's return to Majorca. It is dedicated to A. Leo. This is the one Karasowski calls the story of Chopin's vision of the antique dead in an isolated tower of Madame Sand's chateau in Nohant. We have seen this legend disproved by one who knows. This Polonaise is not as feverish and as exalted as the previous one. It is, as Kleszynski writes, the type of a war song. Named the Heroic, one hears it in Elhert's Ring of Damascene Blade and Silver Spur. There is imaginative splendor in this thrilling work, with its thunder of horses' hooves and fierce challenges. What fire, what sword thrust and smoke and clash of mortal conflict! Here is no psychical presentation, but an objective picture of battle, of concrete contours, and with a cleaving brilliancy that excites the blood to boiling pitch. That Chopin ever played it as intended is incredible. None but the heroes of the keyboard may grasp its dense chordal masses, its fiery projectiles of tone. But there is something disturbing, even ghostly, in the strange intermezzo that separates the trio from the Polonaise. Both mist and starlight are in it. Yet the work is played too fast, and has been nicknamed the Drum Polonaise, losing in majesty and force because of the vanity of virtuosi. 
The octaves in E major are spun out as if speed were the sole idea of this episode. Follow Kleczynski's advice and do not sacrifice the polonaise to the octaves. Karl Tossig, so Giuseppe and de Lenz assert, played this polonaise in an unapproachable manner. Powerful battle tableau as it is, it may still be presented so as not to shock one's sense of the euphonious, of the limitations of the instrument. This work becomes vapid and unheroic when transferred to the orchestra. The Polonaise Fantasie in A-flat, Op. 61, given to the world September 1846, is dedicated to Madame A. Verret. One of three great Polonaises, it is just beginning to be understood, having been derided as amorphous, febrile, of little musical moment, even Liszt declaring that such pictures possesses but little real value to art. Deplorable visions, which the artist should admit with extreme circumspection within the graceful circle of his charmed realm. This was written in the old-fashioned days, when art was aristocratic and excluded the baser and more painful emotions. For a generation accustomed to the realism of Richard Strauss, the fantasy polonaise seems vaporous and idealistic, with all new. It recalls one of those enchanted flasks of the Magi, from which an opening smoke exhales that gradually shapes itself into fantastic and fearsome figures. This polonaise at no time exhibits the solidity of its two predecessors. Its plasticity defies the imprint of the conventional polonaise, though we ever feel its rhythms. It may be full of monologues, interspersed cadenzas, improvised preludes and short phrases, as Kulik suggests, yet there is unity in the composition the units of structure and style. It was music of the future when Chopin composed, it is now music of the present, as much as Richard Wagner's. But the realism is a trifle clouded. Here is a duality of Chopin the suffering man and Chopin the prophet of Poland. Undimmed is his poetic vision, Poland will be free, undaunted his soul, though oppressed by a suffering body. There are in the work throes of agony blended with the trumpet notes of triumph. And what puzzled our fathers, the shifting lights and shadows, the restless tonalities, are welcome, for at the beginning of this new century the chromatic is king. The ending of this polonaise is triumphant, recalling in key and climaxing the A-flat ballad. Chopin is still the captain of his soul, and Poland will be free. Are Celt and Slav doomed to follow ever the phosphorescent lights of patriotism? Liszt acknowledges the beauty and grandeur of this last polonaise, which unites the characteristics of superb and original manipulation in the form, the martial, and the melancholic. Opus 71, three posthumous pol polonaises given to the world by Julius Fontana, are in D minor, published in 1827, B flat minor, 1828, and F minor, 1829. They are interesting to Chopinists. The influence of Weber, the past master of this form, is felt. Of the three, the last in F minor is the strongest, although if Chopin's age is taken into consideration, the first, in D minor, is a feat for a lad of eighteen. I agree with Nix that the posthumous polonaise, without opus number, in G-sharp minor, was composed later than 1822, the date given in the Breitkopf and Hartel edition. It is an artistic conception, and in light-winged figuration far more mature than the Chopin of Opus 71. Really a graceful and effective little composition of the florid order, but like his early music, without poetic depth. The Warsaw Echo Musicale, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Chopin's death, published a special number in October 1899 with a picture of a farmer named Krzysztof, born in 1810, the year after the composer. Verat Fink remarked, that it is not a case of survival of the fittest. A facsimile reproduction of a hitherto unpublished polonaise in A-flat, written at the age of eleven, is also included in this unique number. This tiny dance shows, it is said, the characteristic physiognomy of the composer. In reality, this Polak is thin, a tentative groping after a form that later was mastered so magnificently by the composer. Here is the way it begins. The autograph is Chopin's. Musical score excerpt. 
The Alla Polacca for piano and cello, opus 3, was composed in 1829, while Chopin was on a visit to Prince Radzivill. It is preceded by an introduction, and is dedicated to Josef Merck, the cellist. Chopin himself pronounced it a brilliant salon piece. It is now not even that, for it sounds antiquated and threadbare. The passage work at times smacks of Chopin and Weber, a hint of the mouvement perpetuel, and the cello has the better of the bargain, evidently written for my lady's chamber. Two polonaises remain. One in B-flat minor was composed in 1826, on the occasion of the composer's departure for Reigns. A footnote to the edition of this rather elegic piece tells this. Adieu to Guillaume Kohlberg is the title, and the trio in D-flat is accredited to an air of Gaza Ladra, with a sentimental au revoir inscribed. Kleczynski has revived the Gepfener and Wolf edition. The little cadenza in chromatic double notes on the last page is of a certainty Chopin, but the Polonaise in G-flat major published by Schott is doubtful. It has a shallow ring, a brilliant superficiality that warrants Nix in stamping it to a possible compilation. There are traces of the master throughout, particularly in the E-flat minor trio, but there are some vile progressions and an air of vulgarity surely not Chopin's. This dance form, since the death of the great composer, has been chiefly developed on the virtuoso side. Beethoven, Schubert, Weber, and even Bach, in his B minor suite for strings and flute, also indulged in this form. Wagner, as a student, wrote a polonaise for four hands, in D, and in Schumann's Papillons there is a charming specimen. Rubinstein composed a most brilliant and dramatic example in E-flat in La Balle. The Liszt polonaises, all said and done, are the most remarkable in design and execution since Chopin, but they are more Hungarian than Polish. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.J. Frank. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Huneker. Chapter 13. Mazurkas, Dances of the Soul, Part One. Quote, Coquetries, vanities, fantasies, inclinations, elegies, vague emotions, passions, conquests, struggles upon which the safety or favors of others depend, all all meet in this dance unquote. thus list de lenz further quotes him of the mazurkas one must harness a new pianist of the first rank to each of them yet list told niecks he did not care much for chopin's mazurkas one often meets in them with bars which might just as well be in another place but as Chopin puts them, perhaps nobody could put them. Liszt, despite the rhapsodical praise of his friend, is not always to be relied upon. Capricious as Chopin, he had days when he disliked not only the mazurkas, but all his music. He confessed to Niex that when he played a half hour for amusement, it was Chopin he took up. There is no more brilliant chapter than this Hungarian's on the dancing of the mazurka by the Poles. It is a companion to his equally sensational description of the Polonaise. He gives a wild, whirling, highly colored narrative of the mazurka, with a coda of extravagant praise of the beauty and fascination of Polish women. Angel through love, demon through fantasy, as Balzac called her. In none of the piano rhapsodies are there such striking passages to be met as in Liszt's overwrought, cadenced prose, prose modeled after Chateaubriand. Niema iak poki, 
nothing equals the Polish women and their divine coquetries. The mazurka is their dance. It is the feminine complement to the heroic and masculine Polonaise. An English writer describes the dancing of the mazurka in contemporary Russia. In the salons of St. Petersburg, for instance, the guests actually dance. They do not merely shamble to and fro in a crowd, crumpling their clothes and ruffling their tempers, and call it a set of quadrilles. They have ample space for the sweeping movements and complicated figures of all the orthodox ball dances, and are generally gifted with sufficient plastic grace to carry them out in style. They carefully cultivate dances calling for a kind of grace which is almost beyond the reach of art. The mazurka is one of the finest of these, and it is quite a favorite at balls on the banks of the Neva. It needs a good deal of room, one or more spurred officers, and grace, grace, and grace. The dash with which the partners rush forward, the clinking and clattering of spurs as heel clashes with heel in mid-air, punctuating the staccato of the music, the loud thud of boots striking the ground, followed by their sibilant slide along the polished floor, then the swift springs and sudden bounds, the whirling gyrations and dizzy evolutions, the graceful genuflections and quick embraces, and all the other intricate and maddening movements to the accompaniment of one of Glinka's or Tchaikovsky's masterpieces, awaken and mobilize all the antique heroism medieval chivalry, and wild romance that lie dormant in the depths of men's being. There is more genuine pleasure in being the spectator of a soul-thrilling dance like that than in taking an active part in the lifeless make-believes performed at society balls in many of the more western countries of Europe. Absolutely Slavonic though a local dance of the province of Masofia, the Masorek, or Mazurka, is written in three-four time, with the usual displaced accent in music of eastern origin. Brodzinski is quoted as saying that in its primitive form, the Masorek is only a kind of Krakowiak, less lively, less sautillant. At its best, it is a dancing anecdote, a story told in a charming variety of steps and gestures. It is intoxicating, rude, humorous, poetic, above all melancholy. When he is happiest, he sings his saddest, does the Pole. Hence his predilection for minor modes. The mazurka is in three-four or three-eight time. Sometimes the accent is dotted, but this is by no means absolute. Here is the rhythm most frequently encountered, although Chopin employs variants and modifications. The first part of the bar has usually the quicker notes. The scale is a mixture of major and minor. Melodies are encountered that grew out of a scale shorn of a degree. Occasionally the augmented second, the Hungarian, is encountered, and skips of a third are frequent occurrence. This, with progressions of augmented fourths and major sevenths, gives to the mazurkas of Chopin an exotic character apart from their novel and original content. As was the case with the Polonaise, Chopin took the framework of the national dance, developed it, enlarged it, and hung upon it his choicest melodies, his most piquant harmonies. He breaks and varies the conventionalized rhythm in a half hundred ways, lifting to the plane of a poem the heavy-hoofed peasant dance. But in this idealization he never robs it altogether of the flavor of the soil. It is, in all its wayward disguises, the Polish mazurka, and is with the Polonaise, according to Rubinstein, the only Polish reflective music he has made, although in all of his compositions we hear him relate rejoicingly of Poland's vanished greatness, singing, mourning, weeping over Poland's downfall and all that, in the most beautiful, the most musical way. 
besides the hard inartistic modulations the startling progressions and abrupt changes of mood that jarred on the old-fashioned moscules and dipped in vitriol the pen of relstab there is in the mazurkas the greatest stumbling block of all the much exploited rubato berlioz swore that chopin could not play in time which was not true and later we shall see that meyerbeer thought the same what to the sensitive critic is a charming wavering and swaying in the measure chopin leans about freely within his bars wrote an english critic for the classicists was a rank departure from the time beat according to liszt's description of the rubato a wind plays in the leaves life unfolds and develops beneath them but the tree remains the same that is the chopin rubato elsewhere a tempo agitated broken interrupted a movement flexible yet at the same time abrupt and languishing and vacillating as the fluctuating breath by which it is agitated chopin was more commonplace in his definition supposing he explained that a piece lasts a given number of minutes it may take just so long to perform the whole but in detail deviations may differ the tempo rubato is probably as old as music itself it is in bach it was practiced by the old italian singers mikuli says that no matter how free chopin was in his treatment of the right hand in melody or arabesque the left kept strict time mozart and not chopin it was who first said let your left hand be your conductor and always keep time hal the pianist once asserted that he proved chopin to be playing four four instead of three four measure in a mazurka chopin laughingly admitted that it was a national trait hal was bewildered when he first heard chopin play for he did not believe such music could be represented by musical signs still he holds that this style has been woefully exaggerated by pupils and imitators if a beethoven symphony or a bach fugue be played with metronomical rigidity it loses its quintessential flavor is it not time the ridiculous falsehoods about the chopin rubato be exposed naturally abhorring anything that would do violence to the structural part of his compositions chopin was a very martinet with his pupils if too much license of tempo was taken his music needs the greatest lucidity in presentation and naturally a certain elasticity of phrasing rhythms need not be distorted nor need there be absurd and vulgar haltings silly and explosive dynamics chopin sentimentalized is chopin butchered he loathed false sentiment and a man whose taste was formed by bach and mozart who was nurtured by the music of these two giants could never have indulged in exaggerated jerky tempi in meaningless expression come let us be done with this fetish of stolen time of the wonderful and so seldom comprehended rubato if you wish to play chopin play him in curves let there be no angularities of surface of measure but in the name of the beautiful do not deliver his exquisitely balanced phrases with the jolting balky eloquence of a cafe chantant singer the very balance and symmetry of the chopin phraseology are internal it must be delivered in a flowing waving manner never square or hard yet with every accent showing like the supple muscles of an athlete beneath his skin without the skeleton a musical composition is flaccid shapeless weak and without character chopin's music needs a rhythmic sense that to us fed upon the few simple forms of the west seems almost abnormal the chopin rubato is rhythm liberated from its scholastic bonds but it does not mean anarchy disorder what makes this popular misconception all the more singular is the freedom with which the classics are now being interpreted 
a Beethoven, and even a Mozart symphony, no longer means a rigorous execution, in which the measure is ruthlessly hammered out by the conductor, but the melodic and emotional curve is followed, and the tempo fluctuates. Why then is Chopin singled out as the evil and solitary representative of a vicious time-beat? Play him as you play Mendelssohn, and your Chopin has evaporated. Again, play him lawlessly, with his accentual life topsy-turvied, and he is no longer Chopin, his caricature only. Pianists of Slavic descent alone understand the secret of the tempo rubato. I have read in a recently started German periodical that to make the performance of Chopin's works pleasing, it is sufficient to play them with less precision of rhythm than the music of other composers. I, on the contrary, do not know a single phrase of Chopin's works, including even the freest among them, in which the balloon of inspiration as it moves through the air is not checked by an anchor of rhythm and symmetry. Such passages as occur in the F minor ballade, the B-flat minor scherzo, the middle part, the F minor prelude, and even the A-flat impromptu are not devoid of rhythm. The most crooked recitative of the F minor concerto, as can be easily proved, has a fundamental rhythm not at all fantastic, and which cannot be dispensed with when playing with orchestra. Chopin never overdoes fantasy, and is always restrained by a pronounced aesthetical instinct. Everywhere the simplicity of his poetical inspiration and his sobriety saves us from extravagance and false pathos. Kleszynski has this in his second volume, for he enjoyed the invaluable prompting of Chopin's pupil, the late Princess Marceline Czartoryska. Niex quotes Madame Frédérique Stretcher, née Muller, a pupil, who wrote of her master. He required adherence to the strictest rhythm, hated all lingering and lagging, misplaced rubatos, as well as exaggerated retardandos. Je vous prie de vous asseoir, he said on such an occasion with gentle mockery and it is just in this respect that people make such terrible mistakes in the execution of his works. And now to the mazurkas, which de Lenz said were Heinrich Heine's songs on the piano. Chopin was a phoenix of intimacy with the piano. In his nocturnes and mazurkas he is unrivaled, downright fabulous. No compositions are so Chopin-ish as the mazurkas. Ironical, sad, sweet, joyous, morbid, sour, sane, and dreamy, they illustrate what was said of their composer. His heart is sad, his mind is gay. That subtle quality for an Occidental, enigmatic, which the Poles call Zal, is in some of them. In others, the fun is almost rough and roaring. Sol, a poisonous word, is a baleful compound of pain, sadness, secret rancor, revolt. It is a Polish quality, and is in the Celtic peoples. Oppressed nations with a tendency to mad lyricism develop this mental secretion of the spleen. Liszt writes that the Sol colors with a reflection now argent, now ardent, the whole of Chopin's works. This sorrow is the very soil of Chopin's nature. He so confessed when questioned by Comtesse d'Agou. Liszt further explains that the strange word includes in its meanings, for it seems packed with them, all the tenderness, all the humility of a regret born with resignation and without a murmur. It also signifies excitement, agitation, rancor, revolt full of reproach, premeditated vengeance, menace never ceasing to threaten if retaliation should ever become possible, 
feeding itself meanwhile with a bitter if sterile hatred sterile indeed must be such a consuming passion even where his patriotism became a lyric cry this saul tainted the source of chopin's joy it made him irascible and with his powers of repression this smouldering smothered rage must have well-nigh suffocated him and in the end proved harmful alike to his person and to his art as in certain phases of disease it heightened the beauty of his later work unhealthy feverish yet beauty without doubt the pearl is said to be a morbid secretion so the spiritual ferment called sol gave to chopin's music its morbid beauty it is in the b minor scherzo but not in the a flat ballade the f minor ballade overflows with it and so does the f sharp minor polonaise but not the first impromptu its dark introspection colors many of the preludes and mazurkas and in the c sharp minor scherzo it is an acrid flowering truly fleur du mal heine and baudelaire two poets far removed from the slavic show traces of the terrible drowsy sol in their poetry it is the collective sorrow and tribal wrath of a downtrodden nation and the mazurkas for that reason have ethnic value as concise even as curt as the preludes they are for the most part highly polished they are dancing preludes and often tiny single poems of great poetic intensity and passionate plaint chopin published during his lifetime forty-one mazurkas in eleven cahiers of three four and five numbers opus six four mazurkas and opus seven five mazurkas were published december eighteen thirty two Opus 6 is dedicated to Comtesse Pauline Plater. Opus 7 to Mr. Johns. Opus 17, Four Mazurkas, May 4th, dedicated to Madame Lina Freppa. Opus 24, Four Mazurkas, November 1835, dedicated to Comte de Pertuis. Opus 30, Four Mazurkas, December 1837, dedicated to Princess Czartoryska. Opus 33, Four Mazurkas, October 1838, dedicated to Comtesse Mostavska. Opus 41, Four Mazurkas, December 1840, dedicated to E. Witwicky. Opus 50, Three Mazurkas, November 1841, dedicated to Leon Smitsavsky. Opus 56, Three Mazurkas, August 1844, dedicated to mademoiselle c maberly opus fifty nine three mazurkas april eighteen forty six no dedication and opus sixty three three mazurkas september eighteen forty seven dedicated to comtesse chosnovska besides there are opus sixty seven and sixty eight published by fontana after chopin's death consisting of eight mazurkas and there are a miscellaneous number, two in A minor, both in the Kulak, Klindworth, and Mukuli editions, one in F-sharp major, said to be written by Charles Mayer, in Klindworth's, and four others, in G, B-flat, D, and C major. This makes in all fifty-six to be grouped and analyzed. Niex thinks there is a well-defined difference between the mazurkas as far as opus 41 and those that follow. In the latter he misses savage beauties and spontaneity. As Chopin gripped the form as he felt more, suffered more, and knew more, his mazurkas grew broader, revealed more Weltschmerz, became elaborate and at times impersonal but seldom lost the racial snap and hue. They are sonnets in their well-rounded mechanism, and, as Schumann says, something new is to be found in each. Toward the last, a few are blithe and jocund, but they are the exceptions. 
in the larger ones the universal quality is felt but to the detriment of the intimate polish characteristics these mazurkas are just what they are called only some dance with the heart others with the heels comprising a large and original portion of chopin's compositions they are the least known perhaps when they wander from the map of poland they lose some of their native fragrance like hardy simple wild flowers they are mostly for the open air the only out-of-doors music chopin ever made but even in the open under the moon the note of self-torture of sophisticated sadness is not absent do not accuse chopin for this is the sign manual of his race the pole suffers in song the joy of his sorrow part two the f sharp minor mazurka of opus six begins with a characteristic triplet that plays such a role in the dance here we find a chopin fuller fledged than in the nocturnes and variations and probably because of the form this mazurka first in publication is melodious slightly mournful but of a delightful freshness the third section with the appoggiaturas realizes a vivid vision of country couples dancing determinedly who plays number two of this set it too has the native wood note wild with its dominant pedal bass its slight twang and its sweet sad melody in c sharp minor there is hearty delight in the major and how natural it seems number three in e is still on the village green and the boys and girls are romping in the dance we hear a drone bass a favorite device of chopin and the chatter of the gossips the bustle of a rural festival the harmonization is rich the rhythmic life vital but in the following one in e flat minor a different note is sounded its harmonies are closer and there is sorrow abroad the incessant circling around one idea as if obsessed by fixed grief is used here for the first but not for the last time by the composer opus seven drew attention to chopin it was the set that brought down the thunders of relstab who wrote if mr chopin had shown this composition to a master the latter would it is to be hoped have torn it and thrown it at his feet which we hereby do symbolically criticism had its amenities in 1833 in a later number of the iris in which a caustic notice appeared of the studies opus ten relstab printed a letter signed chopin the authenticity of which is extremely doubtful in it chopin is made to call the critic really a very bad man niecks demonstrates that the polish pianist was not the writer it reads like the effusion of some indignant well-meaning female friend the b flat major mazurka which opens opus seven is the best known of these dances there is an expansive swing a laissez aller to this piece with its air of elegance that are very alluring the rubato flourishes and at the close we hear the footing of the peasant a jolly reckless composition that makes one happy to be alive and dancing the next which begins in a minor is as if one danced upon one's grave a change to major does not deceive it is too heavy-hearted number three in f minor with its rhythmic pronouncement at the start brings us back to earth the triplet that sets off the phrase has great significance guitar-like is the bass in its snapping resolution the section that begins on the dominant of d flat is full of vigor and imagination the left hand is given a solo this mazurka has the true ring the following one in a flat is a sequence of moods its assertiveness soon melts into tenderer hues and in an episode in a we find much to ponder 
Number five in C consists of three lines. It is a sort of coda to the opus, and full of the echoes of lusty happiness, a silhouette with a marked profile. Opus 17, number one, in B-flat, is bold, chivalric, and I fancy I hear the swish of the warrior's saber. The peasant has vanished, or else gapes through the open window, while his master goes through the paces of a courtlier dance. We encounter sequential chords of the seventh, and their use, rhythmically framed as they are, gives a line of sternness to the dance. Niex thinks that the second mazurka might be called the request. So pathetic, playful, and persuasive is it. It is an E minor and has a plaintive, appealing quality. The G major part is very pretty. In the last lines the passion mounts, but is never shrill. Kulak notes that in the fifth and sixth bars there is no slur in certain editions. Klindworth employs it, but marks the B sforzando. A slur on two notes of the same pitch with Chopin does not always mean a tie. The A-flat mazurka number three is pessimistic, threatening, and irritable. Though in the key of E major, the trio displays a relentless sort of humor. The return does not mend matters. A dark page. In A minor, the fourth is called by Skulk the Little Jew. Skulk, who wrote anecdotes of Chopin and collected them with the title of Friedrich Chopin, told the story to Kleczynski. It is this. Chopin did not care for program music, though more than one of his compositions, full of expression and character, may be included under that name. Who does not know the A minor mazurka of Opus 17, dedicated to Lina Freppa? It was already known in our country as the Little Jew, before the departure of our artist abroad. It is one of the works of Chopin which are characterized by distinct humor. A Jew in slippers and a long robe comes out of his inn, and seeing an unfortunate peasant, his customer, intoxicated, tumbling about the road and uttering complaints, exclaims from his threshold, "'What is this?' Then, as if by way of contrast to this scene, the gay wedding party of a rich burgess comes along on its way from church with shouts of various kinds, accompanied in a lively manner by violins and bagpipes. The train passes by, the tipsy peasant renews his complaints, the complaints of a man who had tried to drown his misery in the glass. The Jew returns indoors, shaking his head and again asking, What was this? The story strikes one as being both childish and commonplace. The mazurka is rather doleful, and there is a little triplet of interrogation standing sentinel at the fourth bar. It is also the last phrase. But what of that? I, too, can build you a program as lofty or lowly as you please, but it will not be Chopin's. Niex, for example, finds this very dance bleak and joyless, of intimate emotional experience, and with jarring tones that strike in and pitilessly wake the dreamer. So there is no predicating the content of music, except in a general way. The mood key may be struck, but in Chopin's case this is by no means infallible. If I write with confidence, it is that begot of desperation for I know full well that my version of the story will not be yours. The A minor mazurka for me is full of hectic despair, whatever that may mean, and its serpentining chromatics and apparently suspended close on the chord of the sixth gives an impression of morbid irresolution modulating into a sort of desperate gaiety. Its tonality accounts for the moods evoked being indeterminate and restless. Opus 24 begins with a G minor mazurka, a favorite because of its comparative freedom from technical difficulties. Although in the minor mode there is mental strength in the piece, 
with its exotic scale of the augmented second and its trio is hearty in the next in c we find besides the curious content a mixture of tonalities lydian and medieval church modes here the trio is occidental the entire piece leaves a vague impression of discontent and the refrain recalls the russian bargemen's songs utilized at various times by tchaikovsky Klindworth uses variants. There is also some editorial differences in the metronomic markings, Mikuli being, according to Kulak, too slow. Mention has not been made, as in the studies and preludes, of the tempi of the mazurkas. These compositions are so capricious, so varied, that Chopin, I am sure, did not play any one of them twice alike. They are creatures of moods, melodic air plants swinging to the rhythms of any vagrant breeze the metronome is for the student but metronome and rubato are as de lenz would have said mutually exclusive the third mazurka of opus twenty four is in a flat it is pleasing not deep a real dance with an ornamental coda but the next ah here is a gem a beautiful and exquisitely colored poem. In B-flat minor, it sends out prehensile filaments that entwine and draw us into the center of a wondrous melody, laden with rich odors, odors that almost intoxicate. The figuration is tropical, and when the major is reached, and those glancing thirty seconds so coyly as sail us, we realize the seductive charm of Chopin. The reprise is still more festooned, and it is almost a relief when the little tender unison begins with its positive chord assertions closing the period. Then follows a fascinating cadenced step, with lights and shades, sweet melancholy driving before it joy, and being routed itself, until the enunciation of the first theme and the dying away of the dance, dancers, and the solid globe itself as if earth had committed suicide for loss of the sun. The last two bars could have been written only by Chopin. They are ineffable sighs. And now the chorus of praise begins to mount in burning octaves. The C minor mazurka, opus 30, is another of those wonderful heartfelt melodies of the master. What can I say of the deepening feeling at the Konanima? It stabs with its pathos. Here is the poet Chopin, the poet who, with Burns, interprets the simple strains of the folk, who blinds us with color and rich romanticism like Keats, and lifts us, Shelley-wise, to transcendental azure. And his only apparatus, a keyboard. As Schumann wrote, Chopin did not make his appearance by an orchestral army, as a great genius is accustomed to do. He only possesses a small cohort, but every soul belongs to him to the last hero. Eight lines is this dance, yet its meanings are almost endless. Number two in B minor is called The Cuckoo by Kleczynski. It is sprightly, and with the lilt, notwithstanding its subtle progressions, of Mazovia. Number three in D-flat is all animation, brightness, and a determination to stay out the dance. The alternate major-minor of the theme is truly Polish. The graceful trio and canorous brilliancy of this dance make it a favored number. The ending is epigrammatic. It comes so suddenly upon us, our cortical cells peeling with the minor, that its very abruptness is witty. One can see Chopin making a mocking moue as he wrote it. Tchaikovsky borrowed the effect for the conclusion of the Chinoise in a miniature orchestral suite. The fourth of this opus is in C-sharp minor. Again, I feel like letting loose the dogs of enthusiasm. The sharp rhythms and solid build of this ample work 
give it a massive character. It is one of the big mazurkas, and the ending, raw as it is, consecutive, bare-faced fifths and sevenths, compasses its intended meaning. Opus 33 is a popular set. It begins with one in G-sharp minor, which is curt and rather depressing. The relief in B major is less real than it seems, on paper. Moody, withal a tender-hearted mazurka, number two in D is bustling, graceful, and full of unrestrained vitality. Bright and not particularly profound, it was successfully arranged for voice by Viardo Garcia. The third of the opus in C is the one described by de Lenz as almost precipitating a violent row between Chopin and Meyerbeer. He had christened it the epitaph of the idea. Two four, said Meyerbeer after de Lenz played it. Three four, answered Chopin, flushing angrily. Let me have it for a ballet in my new opera, and I'll show you, retorted Meyerbeer. It's three four, scolded Chopin, and played it himself. De Lenz says they parted coolly, each holding to his opinion. Later in St. Petersburg, Meyerbeer met this gossip and told him that he loved Chopin. I know no pianist, no composer for the piano like him. Meyerbeer was wrong in his idea of the tempo. Though Chopin slurs the last beat, it is there nevertheless. This mazurka is only four lines long and is charming, as charming as the brief specimen in the preludes. The next mazurka is another famous warhorse. In B minor it is full of veiled coquetries, hazardous mood transitions, growling recitatives, and smothered plaints. The continual return to the theme gives rise to all manner of fanciful programs. One of the most characteristic is by the Polish poet Zielinski, who, so Klesinski relates, wrote a humorous poem on this mazurka. For him it is a domestic comedy in which a drunken peasant and his much-abused wife enact a little scene. Returning home the worse for wear, he sings, Oi Tadana, O oh dear me, and rumbles in the bass in a figure that answers the treble. His wife reproaching him, he strikes her. Here we are in B-flat. She laments her fate in B major. Then her husband shouts, Be quiet, old vixen! This is given in the octaves, a genuine dialogue, the wife tartly answering, "'Shan't be quiet!' The gruff grumbling in the bass is heard, an imitation of the above, when suddenly the man cries out, the last eight bars of the composition, "'Kitty, kitty, come! Do come here! I forgive you!' which is decidedly masculine in its magnanimity." If one does not care for the rather coarse realism of this reading, Kleczynski offers the poem of Ujajeski, called The Dragoon. The soldier flatters a girl at the inn. She flies from him, and her lover, believing she has deceived him, despairingly drowns himself. The ending, with its ring, ring, ring the bell there, horses carry me to the depths, has more poetic contour than the other. Without grafting any libretto on it, this mazurka is a beautiful tone piece in itself. Its theme is delicately mournful, and the subject in B major simply entrancing in its broad, flowing melody. In C sharp minor, opus 41, is a mazurka that is beloved of me. Its scale is exotic, its rhythm convincing, its tune a little saddened by life, but courage never fails. This theme sounds persistently in the middle voices, in the bass, and at the close in full harmonies, unisons, giving it a startling effect. Octaves take it up in profile until it vanishes. Here is the very apotheosis of rhythm. Number two in E minor is not very resolute of heart. 
it was composed soniex avers at palma when chopin's health fully accounts for the depressed character of the piece for it is sad to the point of tears of opus forty one he wrote to fontana from nohant in eighteen thirty nine you know i have four new mazurkas one from palma in e minor three from here in b major a flat major and c sharp minor they seem to me pretty as the youngest children usually do when the parents grow old number three is a vigorous sonorous dance number four over which the editors deviate on the serious matter of text in a flat is for the concert room and is allied to several of his gracious valses playful and decorative but not profound in feeling Opus 50, the first in G major, is healthy and vivacious. Good humor predominates. Kulak notes that in some editions it closes pianissimo, which seems a little out of drawing. Number two is charming. In A flat, it is a perfect specimen of the aristocratic mazurka. The D flat trio, the answering episode in B flat minor, and the grace of the return make this one to be studied and treasured. De Lenz finds Bachian influences in the following, in C-sharp minor. It begins as though written for the organ, and ends in an exclusive salon. It does him credit, and is worked out more fully than the others. Chopin was much pleased when I told him that in the construction of this mazurka, the passage from E major to F major, was the same as that in the Agatha aria in Freischutz. De Lenz refers to the opening Bach-like mutations. The texture of this dance is closer and finer spun than any we have encountered. Perhaps spontaneity is impaired. Mais que voulez-vous? Chopin was bound to develop, and his mazurkas, fragile and constricted as is the form, were sure to show a like record of spiritual and intellectual growth. Opus 56 in B major is elaborate, even in its beginning. There is decoration in the ritornelle in E-flat, and one feels the absence of a compensating emotion, despite the display of contrapuntal skill. Very virtuoso-like, but not so intimate as some of the others. Karasowski selects number two in C as an illustration. It is as though the composer had sought for the moment to divert himself with narcotic intoxication, only to fall back the more deeply into his original gloom. There is the peasant in the first bars in C, but the A minor and what follows soon disturb the air of bonhomie. Theoretical ease is in the imitative passages. Chopin is now master of his tools. The third mazurka of Opus 56 is in C minor. It is quite long and does not give the impression of a whole. With the exception of a short break in B major, it is composed with the head, not the heart, nor yet the heels. Not unlike in its sturdy affirmation, the one in C sharp minor, Opus 41, is the next mazurka in A minor, opus 59. That Chopin did not repeat himself is an artistic miracle. A subtle turn takes us off the familiar road to some strange glade wherein the flowers are rare in scent and odor. This mazurka, like the one that follows, has a dim resemblance to others, yet there is always a novel point of departure, a fresh harmony, a sudden melody or an unexpected ending. Hadow, for example, thinks the A-flat of this opus the most beautiful of them all. In it he finds legitimately used the repetition in various shapes of a single phrase. To me, this mazurka seems but an amplification, an elaboration of the lovely one in the same key, opus 50, number 2. The double sixths and more complicated phraseology do not render the later superior to the early mazurka, yet there is no gainsaying the fact that this is a noble composition. 
but the next in f sharp minor despite its rather saturnine gaze is stronger in interest if not in workmanship while it lacks niecks bolt sauvage is it not far loftier in conception and execution than opus six in f sharp minor the inevitable triplet appears in the third bar and is a hero throughout oh here is charm for you read the close of the section in f sharp major in the major it ends the triplet fading away at last a mere shadow a turn on d sharp but victor to the last chopin is at the summit of his invention time and tune that wait for no man are now his bond slaves pathos delicacy boldness a measured melancholy and the art of euphonious presentiment of all these and many factors more stamp this mazurka a masterpiece niecks believes there is a return of the early freshness and poetry in the last three mazurkas opus sixty three they are indeed teeming with interesting matter he writes looked at from the musician's point of view how much do we not see novel and strange beautiful and fascinating withal sharp dissonances chromatic passing notes suspensions and anticipations displacement of accent progressions of perfect fifths the horror of schoolman sudden turns and unexpected digressions that are so unaccountable so out of the line of logical sequence that one's following the composer is beset with difficulties but all this is a means to an end the expression of an individuality with its intimate experiences the emotional content of many of these trifles trifles if considered only by their size is really stupendous spoken like a brave man and not a pedant full of vitality is the first number of opus sixty three in b major it is sufficiently various in figuration and rhythmical life to single it from its fellows the next in f minor has a more elegiac ring brief and not difficult of matter or manner is this dance the third of winning beauty is in c sharp minor surely a pendant to the c sharp minor valse i defy any one to withstand the pleading eloquent voice of this mazurka slender in technical configuration yet it impressed louis ehlert so much that he was impelled to write a more perfect canon in the octave could not have been written by one who had grown gray in the learned arts the four mazurkas published posthumously in eighteen fifty five that comprise opus sixty seven were composed by chopin at various dates to the first in g klindworth affixes eighteen forty nine as the year of composition niecks gives a much earlier date eighteen thirty five i fancy the latter is correct as the piece sounds like one of chopin's more youthful efforts it is jolly and rather superficial the next in g minor is familiar it is very pretty and its date is set down by niecks as eighteen forty nine while klindworth gives eighteen thirty five here again niecks is correct although i suspect that klindworth transposed his figures accidentally number three in c was composed in eighteen thirty five on this both biographer and editor agree it is certainly an early effusion of no great value although a good dancing tune number four a minor of this opus composed in eighteen forty six is more mature but in no wise remarkable opus sixty eight the second of the fontana set was composed in eighteen thirty the first in c is commonplace the one in a minor composed in eighteen twenty seven is much better being lighter and well made the third in f major eighteen thirty weak and trivial and the fourth in f minor eighteen forty nine interesting because it is said by julius fontana to be chopin's last composition 
he put it on paper a short time before his death, but was too ill to try it at the piano. It is certainly morbid in its sick insistence in phrase repetition, close harmonies, and wild departure in A from the first figure. But it completes the gloomy and sardonic loop, and we wish, after playing this veritable song of the tomb, that we had parted from Chopin in health, not disease. This page is full of the premonitions of decay. Too weak and faltering to be febrile, Chopin is here a debile, prematurely exhausted young man. There are a few accents of a forced gaiety, but they are swallowed up in the mists of dissolution, the dissolution of one of the most sensitive brains ever wrought by nature. Here we may echo, without any savor of Liszt's condescension or de Lenz's irony, Pauvre Frederic. Clindworth and Kulak have different ideas concerning the end of this mazurka. Both are correct. Kulak, Clindworth, and Mikuli include in their editions two mazurkas in A minor. Neither is impressive. One, the date of composition unknown, is dedicated à son ami Émile Gaillard. The other first appeared in a musical publication of Schott's, about 1842 or 1843, according to Niex. Of this set, I prefer the former. It abounds in octaves and ends with a long trill. There is in the Clindworth edition a mazurka, the last in the set, in the key of F-sharp. It is so unchopanish and artificial that the doubts of the pianist's Ernst power were aroused as to its authenticity. On inquiry, Niex quotes from the London Monthly Musical Record, July 1, 1882, Power discovered that the piece was identical with a mazurka by Charles Mayer. Gothard, being the publisher of the alleged Chopin mazurka, declared he bought the manuscript from a Polish countess, possibly one of the fifty in whose arms Chopin died, and that the lady parted with Chopin's autograph because of her dire poverty. It is, of course, a clear case of forgery. Of the four early mazurkas in G major and B flat major, dating from 1825, D major, composed in 1829 and 30, but remodeled in 1832, and C major of 1833, the latter is the most characteristic. The G major is of slight worth. As Niex remarks, it contains a harmonic error. The one in B-flat starts out with a phrase that recalls the A minor mazurka, numbered 45 in the Breitkopf and Hartel edition. This B-flat mazurka, early as it was composed, is nevertheless pretty. There are breadth and decision in the C major mazurka. The recasting improves the D major mazurka. Its trio is lifted an octave, and the doubling of notes throughout gives more weight and richness. In the minor key, laughs and cries, dances and mourns the slog, says Dr. J. Schucht in his monograph on Chopin. Chopin here reveals not only his nationality, but his own fascinating and enigmatic individuality. Within the tremulous spaces of this immature dance is enacted the play of a human soul, a soul that voices the sorrow and revolt of a dying race, of a dying poet. They are epigrammatic, fluctuating, crazy, and tender, these mazurkas, and some of them have a soft, melancholy light, as if shining through alabaster, true corpse light leading to a morass of doubt and terror but a fantastic, disheveled, debonair spirit is the guide, and to him we abandon ourselves in these precise and vertiginous dances. End of chapter 13 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon Chapter 14 of Chopin the Man and His Music. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman. Chopin, The Man and His Music, by James Hunnaker. Chapter 14. Chopin, The Conqueror. The scherzi of Chopin are of his own creation. The type, as illustrated by Beethoven and Mendelssohn, had no meaning for him. Whether in earnest or serious jest, Chopin pitched on a title that is widely misleading when the content is considered. The Beethoven scherzo is full of a robust sort of humor. In it, he is seldom poetical, frequently given to gossip, and at times he hints at the mystery of life, the demoniacal element, the fierce jollity that mocks itself the almost titanic anger of Chopin would not have been regarded by the composer of the Eroica symphony as adapted to the form. The Pole practically built up a new musical structure, boldly called it a scherzo, and, and, as in the case of the ballades, poured into its elastic mold most disturbing and incomparable music. Chopin seldom compasses sublimity, his arrows are tipped with fire, yet they do not fly far, but in some of his music he skirts the regions where abide the gods. In at least one scherzo, in one ballade, in the F minor fantasia, in the first two movements of the B flat minor sonata, in several of the etudes, and in one of the preludes, he compasses grandeur, individuality of utterance, beauty of utterance, and the eloquence we call divine are his. Criticism then bows its questioning brows before this anointed one. In the scherzi, Chopin is often prophet as well as poet. He fumes and frets, but upon his countenance is the precious fury of the sibyls. We see the soul that suffers from secret convulsions, but forgive the writhing for the music made. These four scherzi are physical records, confessions committed to paper of outpourings that never could have passed the lips. From these alone we may almost reconstruct the real Chopin, the inner Chopin, whose conventional exterior so ill prepared the world for the tragic issues of his music. The first scherzo is a fair model. There are a few bars of introduction, the porch, as Naix would call it, a principal subject, a trio, a short working out section, a skillful return to the opening theme, and an elaborate coda. This edifice, not architecturally flawless, is better adapted to the florid beauties of the Byzantine treatment than to the severe Hellenic line. Yet Chopin gave it dignity, largeness, and a classic massiveness. The interior is romantic, is modern, personal, but the façade shows gleaming minarets, the strangely builded shapes of the Orient. This B minor scherzo has the acid note of sorrow and revolt, yet the complex figuration never wavers. The walls stand firm despite the hurricane blowing through and around them. Elert finds this scherzo tornadic. It is gusty and the hurry and overemphasis do not endear it to the pianist. The first pages are filled with wrathful sounds. There is much tossing of hands and cries to heaven, calling down its fire and brimstone. A climax mounts to a fine frenzy until the lyric intermezzo in B is reached. Here, love chants with honeyed tongues. The widely dispersed figure of the melody has an entrancing tenderness. But peace does not long prevail against the powers of Iblis, and infernal is the wild jagged of the finale. After shrillest of dissonances, a chromatic uproar pilots the doomed one across the desperate sticks. What Chopin's program was we can but guess. He may have outlined the composition in a moment of great ebullition, a time of soul laceration arising from a cat scratch, or a quarrel with Maurice Sahn in the garden over the possession of the goat cart. 
the cleaned verth edition is preferable. Kulak follows his example in using the double note stems in the B major part. He gives the A sharp in the bass six bars before the return of the first motif. Cleaned verth and other editions prescribe A natural, which is not so effective. This scherzo might profit by being played without the repeats. The chromatic interlocked octaves at the close are very striking. I find at times, as my mood changes, something almost repellent in the B minor scherzo. It does not present the frank physiognomy of the second scherzo, opus 31, in B flat minor. Ehlert cries that it was composed in a blessed hour, although Dulens quotes Chopin as saying of the opening, quote, It must be a charnel house. Unquote. The defiant challenge of the beginning has no savor of the scorn and drastic mockery of its forerunner. We are conscious that tragedy impends, that after the prologue may follow fast catastrophe, yet it is not feared with all the portentous thunder of its index. Nor are we deceived. A melody of winning distinction unrolls before us. It has a noble tone, is of a noble type. Without relaxing pace it passes and drops like a thunderbolt into the bowels of the earth. Again the story is told, and tarrying not at all we are led to a most delectable spot in the key of A major. This trio is marked by genius. Can anything be more bewitching than the episode in C-sharp minor merging into E major, with the overflow at the close? The fantasy is notable for variety of tonality, freedom in rhythmical incidents, and genuine power. The coda is dizzy and overwhelming. For Schumann, this scherzo is Byronic in tenderness and boldness. Karasowski speaks of its Shakespearean humor, and indeed it is a very human and lovable piece of art. It holds richer, warmer, redder blood than the other three, and like the A-flat ballade, is beloved of the public, but then it is easier to understand. Opus 39, the third scherzo in C-sharp minor, was composed or finished at Majorca and is the most dramatic of the set. I confess to see no littleness in the polished phrases, though irony lurks in its bars and there is fever in its glance, a glance full of enigmatic and luring scorn. I heartily agree with Hadot, who finds the work clear-cut and of exact balance, and noting that Chopin founded whole paragraphs, quote, either on a single phrase repeated in similar shapes or on two phrases in alternation, unquote, a primitive practice in Polish folk songs, he asserts that, quote, Beethoven does not attain the lucidity of his style by such parallelism or phraseology, unquote, but admits that Chopin's methods made for, quote, clearness and precision may be regarded as characteristic of the national manner, unquote, a thoroughly personal characteristic, too. There is virile clangor in the firmly struck octaves of the opening pages. No hesitating, morbid view of life, but rank, harsh assertiveness, not untinged with splatonic anger. The chorale of the trio is admirably devised and carried out. Its piety is a bit of liturgical make-believe. The contrasts here are most artistic, sonorous harmonies set off by broken chords that deliciously tinkle. There is a coda of frenetic movement, and the end is in major, a surprising conclusion when considering all that has gone before. Never to become the property of the profane, the C-sharp minor scherzo, notwithstanding its marked disparities and agitated moments, is a great work of art. Without the inner freedom of its predecessor, it is more sober and self-contained than the B minor scherzo. The fourth scherzo, opus 54, is in the key of E, built up by a series of cunning touches and climaxes, and without the mood depth or variety of its brethren, it is more truly a scherzo than any of them. It has tripping lightness, and there is sunshine imprisoned behind its open bars. Of it, Schumann could not ask, quote, How is gravity to clothe itself if jest goes about in dark veils? Unquote. Here, then, 
is intellectual refinement and jesting of a superior sort. Nyx thinks it fragmentary. I find the fairy-like measures delightful after the doleful mutterings of some of the other scherzi. There is the same spirit of opposition, but of arrogance none. The C-sharp minor theme is of lyric beauty, the coda with its scales brilliant. It seems to be banned by classicists and Chopin worshippers alike. The agnostic attitude is not yet dead in the piano-playing world. Rubinstein most admired the first two scherzi. The B minor has been criticized for being too much in the etude vein. But with all their shortcomings, these compositions are without peer in the literature of the piano. They were published and dedicated as follows. Opus 20, February 1835, to M. T. Albrecht. Opus 31, December, 1837, Comtesse de Fersenstein. Opus 39, October 1840, Adolf Gutmann. And Opus 54, December, 1843, Maille de Caraman. De Lenz relates that Chopin dedicated the C-sharp minor scherzo to his pupil Gutmann because this giant, with a prize fighter's fists, could, quote, knock a hole in the table. Unquote, with a certain chord for the left hand, sixth measure from the beginning, and adds quite naively, quote, Nothing more was ever heard of this Gutmann. He was a discovery of Chopin's. Unquote. Chopin died in this same Gutmann's arms, and, despite de Lenz, Gutmann was in evidence until his death as a quote, favorite pupil. Unquote. And now we have reached the grandest, oh, banal and abused word, of Chopin's compositions, the Fantasia in F minor, opus 49. Robert Schumann, after remarking the cosmopolitan must, quote, sacrifice the small interests of the soil on which he was born, unquote, notices that Chopin's later works, quote, begin to lose something of their especial Sarmatian physiognomy, to approach partly more nearly the universal ideal cultivated by the divine Greeks which we find again in Mozart." Unquote. The F minor fantasia has hardly the Mozartian serenity, but parades a formal beauty, not disfigured by an excess of violence, either personal or patriotic, and its melodies, if restless by melancholy, are of surprising nobility and dramatic grandeur. Without including the Beethoven sonatas, not strictly born of the instrument, I do not fear to maintain that this fantasia is one of the greatest of piano pieces, never properly appreciated by pianists, critics, or public, it is, after more than half a century of neglect, being understood at last. It was published November 1843, and probably composed at Nohant, as a letter of the composer indicates. The dedication is to Princess C. de Suzo, these interminable countesses and princesses of Chopin. For Nyx, who could not at first discern its worth, it suggests a titan in commotion. It is titanic, the torso of some Faust-like dream. It is Chopin's Faust a macabre march, containing some dangerous dissonances, gravely ushers us to ascending staircases of triplets, only to precipitate us at to the very abysses of the piano. That first subject, is it not almost as ethically puissant and passionate as Beethoven in his F minor sonata? Chopin's lack of tenaciousness is visible here. Beethoven would have built a cathedral on such a foundational scheme, but Chopin, ever prodigal in his melody-making, dashes impetuously to the A-flat episode, that heroic love chant erroneously marked Dolce, and played with the effeminacies of a salon. Three times does it resound in this strange hall of glancing mirrors, yet not once should it be caressed. The bronze fingers of Tosig are needed, now are arching the triplets to the great, thrilling song beginning in C minor, and then the octaves, in contrary motion, split wide asunder the very earth, 
After terrific chordal reverberations there is the rapid retreat of vague armies, and once again is begun the ascent of the rolling triplets to inaccessible heights, and the first theme sounds in C minor. The modulation lifts to G flat, only to drop to abysmal depths. What mighty, dismal cause is being espoused? When peace is presaged in the key of B, is this the prize for which strive these agonized hosts? Is some forlorn princess locked behind these solemn, inaccessible bars? For a few moments there is contentment beyond all price. Then the warring tribe of triplets recommence. After clamorous G-flat octaves reeling from the stars to the sea of the first theme, another rush into D-flat ensues, the song of C minor reappears in F minor, and the miracle is repeated. Oracular octaves quake the cellarage of the palace. The warriors hurry by, their measured tramp is audible after they vanish, and the triplets obscure their retreat with chromatic vapors. Then, an adagio in this fantastic old world tale, the curtain prepares to descend. A faint, sweet voice sings a short, appealing cadenza, and after billowing a flat arpeggios, soft, great hummocks of tone, Two giant chords are sounded, and the ballade of love and war is over. Who conquers? Is the lady with the green eyes and moon-white face rescued? Or is all this a De Quincey's dream fugue translated into tone, a sonorous, awesome vision? Like De Quincey, it suggests the apparition of the empire of fear, the fear that is secretly felt with dreams wherein the spirit expands to the drummings of infinite space. Alas, for the validity of subjective criticism, Franz Liszt told Vladimir de Pachmann the program of the Fantasia, as related to him by Chopin. At the close of one desperate, immemorial day, the pianist was crooning at the piano, his spirits vastly depressed. Suddenly came a knocking at his door, a Poe-like, sinister tapping which he at once rhythmically echoed upon the keyboard his phonomotor center being unusually sensitive the first two bars of the fantasia describe these rappings just as the third and fourth stand for chopin's musical invitation entres entresla this is all repeated until the doors wide open swinging admit liszt georges Assange, Madame Camilla Playa de Mac, and others. To the solemn measures of March they enter, and range themselves about Chopin, who after the agitated triplets begins his complaint in the mysterious song in F minor. But San, with whom he has quarreled, falls before him on her knees and pleads for pardon. Straightway the chant merges into the appealing A-flat section, this sends skyward my theory of its interpretation, and from C minor the current becomes more tempestuous until the climax is reached, and to the second march the intruders rapidly vanish. The remainder of the work, with the exception of the lento sostenuto in B, where it is to be hoped Chopin's perturbed soul finds momentary peace, is largely repetition and development. This far from ideal reading is an authoritative one, coming as it does from Chopin by way of Liszt. I console myself for its rather commonplace character with the notion that perhaps in the retelling the story has caught some personal cadenzas of the two historians. In any case, I shall cling to my own version. The F. Mitre Fantasia will mean many things to many people. Chopin has never before maintained so artistically, so free from delirium, such a level of strong passion, mental power, and exalted euphony. It is his largest canvas, and though there are no long-breathed periods such as in the B-flat minor scherzo, the phraseology is amply broad, without padding of paragraphs. The rapt interest is not relaxed until the final bar. This transcendental work more than nearly approaches Beethoven in its unity, its formal rectitude, and its brave economy of thematic material. While few men have dared to unlock their hearts thus, Chopin is not so intimate here as in the Mazurkas. 
but the pulse beats ardently in the tissues of this composition as art for art it is less perfect the gain is on the human side nearing his end chopin discerned with ever widening ever brighter vision the great heart throb of the universe master of his material if not of his mortal tenement he passionately strove to shape his dreams into abiding sounds he did not always succeed but his victories are the precious prizes of mankind one is loath to believe that the echo of chopin's magic music can ever fall upon unheeding ears he may become old-fashioned but like mozart he will remain eternally beautiful end of chapter fourteen recording by robert hoffman akron ohio end of chopin the man and his music by james hunnicker